once I hired the first employee and I n noticed that a lot of the work could get done without me being there, it was eye-opening. I was like, oh, wow. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running and managing an architectural practice that helps you do your best work more often. Now, if you haven't already gotten access to our free 60-minute firm owner training on how you can structure your small architectural practice for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial reward, head on over to smartpracticemethod.com. Com. Easy to remember, smartpracticemethod.com. That's a free 60-minute training. We've condensed down a decade plus of information, best practices, and tools for you if you run a small practice for how to build the practice of your dream. And, and now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. The Big Red A is coming to San Francisco. If you're going to the AIA 23 conference, go stop by RCAT at booth 835. RCAT saves you time and money with over 10,500 manufacturer listings by Alpha or CSI section. 7,000 free BIM models, 900 specs, and much more like Spec Wizard, the patented tool that allows you to configure and generate a full three-part specification in minutes. If you're a manufacturer of fine building products, also please stop by RCAT and see how they can get you in front of AEC professionals searching for the right solutions for their projects. Go ahead on over to the Big Red A at booth 835 at the AIA conference. I'll see you there. It's my honor today to have on the podcast today, Ramiro Torres, who's a small firm practice owner. He's one of the valiant. He's one of the brave. He's one of these crazy souls who decided to take upon himself firm ownership. Uh, and he's based out of San Jose, California. Ramiro's had his firm for years. And he is also uh, a client that's coached with us, that's that's brought on the business of architecture team uh, to help him augment what he's doing in his firm. And so I'm really glad to have Ramiro here on the podcast with us today to talk. We can talk a little bit about the work we've done together, Ramiro but specifically about your practice and your journey as a practice owner and some of the challenges that you've had because it's not easy running an architectural practice. As a matter of fact, it's very, very difficult. And despite the difficulty, you've had enormous success doing it. And so we want to share all the learnings, but also all the challenges that you've had with our audience so that, as always, we can raise the boat, so to speak. As the rising tide rises, we want all firms to better their practices, be able to charge higher fees, uh, have better salaries, and really enjoy the the wealth and the abundance they're meant to have. So, Ramiro, welcome to the show. Thank you, Enoch. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Uh, Romero, you've been working with us for a while. As a matter of fact, back when we had Scott Beebe on board and we were doing the Architecture from Freedom Formula program, which was a smaller condensed version of Smart Practice, you joined that program originally. But let's let's go even farther back because you have a very interesting history. Uh, you have the uniqueness of being um, a Latino or Hispanic architecture firm owner, which we know that there's not a whole lot of those in the industry, um, but you've had a lot of success uh, in the industry. And so you grew up in Mexico. Tell me about that. What age did you come to the U.S. and what was it like growing up in Mexico? So, uh, so yeah, so my, my dad actually um, used to come as a migrant worker to the United States. You know, he will spend uh, six months here and then go back to Mexico in six months. And we were all uh, living over there. And uh, what was that like? If I can interrupt, what was that like having your dad just completely gone for six months? You know what? Uh, it was, as I remember, he always seemed to be there, even though he wasn't there for a few months. You know, oh, wow, was, that's great. Just something about it that, you know, he always made himself present, you know, by, by you know, writing us letters, you know, giving us phone calls. That's amazing. But uh, there was something that, um, you know, I never really missed them. You know, that's a little strange, but that's how it yeah. was. Yeah. Uh, I think it also helped that I'm the youngest of 10 children. So I think mm. my brothers and sisters were, you know, feeling the whole of my father not being there when 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 uh when he was uh that makes sense you, you had you had yeah, not so, you had nine yeah, fathers and mothers <laughs> right pretty much yes <laughs> <laughs> that's right but yeah you know we're, we're from a small town uh near guadalajara in the state of jalisco uh, the town is about uh you know 10 15 000 people not not that much and uh the journey really there was that uh for me to go beyond middle school there was very little options you know so you actually mm. went through um elementary school and then you did three years of middle school and after that there was hardly any options you know the the only options will be for me to go to the bigger city guadalajara uh, which you know my brother had a house there and he said yeah you know go and use the house if you need to uh, but then the the other opportunity was for me to come to the states uh, one of the things that my dad did well uh, 
what I really thank him for that is that in his journeys over here, uh, he applied for the whole family to get green cards. And at some point, you know, the, the rancher that he was working with in Gilroy uh, granted him a, a residency and sponsored him for not only him to to be a permanent resident, but the entire family. So at wow. some point, you know, we all had uh, green cards, right? Wow. Which was uh, a huge, huge step to uh, us coming here, you know, not being fearful of deportation or anything else, but just, you know, having the, the right to be here in the States. Yeah. So so that was uh, something that my father did well, and I really thank him for that. Wow. Uh, but the journey was not easy. You know, like, you know, after middle school, like I said, you know, um, it was, I had those two options, you know, stay in Mexico or, or come to the States. And since a lot of the family that I that I uh, was growing up with was already here, I said, you know what, let me try and see how it is in the, in the United States. If I don't like it, I could always go back, right? So uh, after middle school, I was still, I was, I think I was 14 years old. I was turning 15 that summer. I, I came, uh, you know, I ended up living with some of my brothers and I enrolled in Gilroy High School, you know, in, in, uh, in the South Bay. And um, after Gilroy High School, um, we were still, you know, living on the farm and, and I, I, I needed to get out of that situation somehow, right? I'm like, you know what, uh, uh, there's something uh, that, that tells me that this is not my life that I need to somehow move forward. And I figure that uh, why don't I go to the community college, try to get good grades and become an architect, right? Now, let me now, pause you there, yeah. Rumor, just go back. So when you moved to the US, sure. uh, probably a big change for you as a young man at that time, going to a completely different country. I mean, it's hard enough to move to a different city. Um, I imagine you probably spoke good English at the time. I spoke no English. <laughs> oh, wow. No English. So, yes. So wow. the, the, the only English that I knew was some of the English that they teach us in, you know, in elementary and middle school, right? Which okay. is, yeah. you know, my name is Ramiro Torres. You know, this is a table. This is a chair, you know, yeah. that kind of yeah. basic stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. So, no, it, was, I, it was pretty shocking, you know, culturally, you know, uh, to, to come here and know no English, you know, be thrown in a school that... It was ninety percent, you know, other than Latino. Yeah, and it, and then even the Latinos that were there, they were, you know, not okay, you know, speaking Spanish. You know, they were, you know, whatever, a little embarrassed of it or, or whatever that was. Yeah, so it, it was wow. a, it was a great cultural shock for me too to enter oh my the goodness. situation. Yeah, but you know what? It was one of those things that um, I needed to quickly learn English. I needed to quickly adapt. And uh, basically, my first year in high school was, you know, uh, going through the, the programs that they had for migrant kids like me to be immersed into the language. And um, I will say about a year later, I wasn't completely fluent, but I could get around. You know, I had that's amazing. That yeah. Point. Wow. Yeah. And um, and I think after high school, I was pretty much completely fluent in English. You know? Okay. It took me two yep. years. Yeah. Uh, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So it learned yeah. English, uh, it not only learned it, but really mastered it through high school, which is just a super impressive feat. Uh, so obviously you're a survivor, you're you're someone yes. that takes the bulls by the horns, you yes. jump in, you're not one to wait around for things to happen passively. You knew you had a, a, a future that you wanted to head towards. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so now yeah. you. Okay, so you're living. You're living in Gilroy, which, by the way, is a beautiful town just the south of uh, of of San Jose, California, yes. and um, beautiful farm fields there. A lot of migrant workers come from Mexico to work there. So you were raised. Your your father was doing that kind of work, and you saw that there was something else for you here. And so yeah, so so yeah, I just figured that the, 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 that life was not my life. You know, I, I thought my family was working in the in the in that industry, and I figured that. I don't know. There was something in the back of my head that always told me you need to get educated, even when I was in mm. Mexico. You know, mm. you need to get educated. So, so when the opportunity came, I went to community college. You know, studied really, really hard. You know, that was my thing. Mm. I need to get you know really good grades for me to be able to apply to universities and get accepted. Yeah. Uh, but you know, a lot of the challenges to Enoch was people not believing in you. You know, I remember having this counselor saying, "Oh, yeah, no, no, you don't kind of don't need to go through four-year college. Just kind of finish this, and mm. you know, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be." Um, It'll it'll be fine, right? What you found is that some people didn't believe you or they yes. didn't have faith in yes. you. Exactly. So I remember even some of the counselors didn't have faith in us, right? They, you know, I, I I told one of the counselors, "Hey, I want to be an architect," and she looked at me like, oh, "No, then you can't do this, right?" Mm. And she said something like, "Oh, you know, why don't why don't you just take some of these classes, you know, get trained here in community college, and then you could actually get a job." So it was even challenging for me at that point to contradict the counselor and, and, and Gavilan College, right? 
Uh, and I said, no, that's not enough for me. You know, I can't, I really can't do this. You know, I really need to go the, the, the full way. So I ended up doing some research myself on the classes that I need to take to, in order to transfer to either Berkeley or Cal Poly. That was the two schools that I, I, I wanted to go. I, I had other options in case I didn't get to those schools like Sac Sacramento State. That was one of the options that I saw for construction managers, not architecture, because I didn't have architecture. Uh, but then, you know, I followed the curriculum of, of how to transfer to a four-year college. And it took me one year longer than I wanted. You know, instead of being a two years, it took me three years to complete all the requirements and, uh, you know, grades good enough to transfer. I applied to both Berkeley and Cal Poly. And at the end, I got accepted to Cal Poly. And uh, I didn't think about it. I just kind of picked up and left. Now, the other problem was, how am I going to pay for this, right? I had no clue. <laughs> mm, so yeah. again, you know, at, at that point I did, I think the counselors in Cal Poly were a lot better than the community college. So when I transferred or about to transfer, um, I went and talked to them, Hey, you know, how is this going to work financially? Uh, I applied to financial aid and grants and luckily I got both, you know, because, uh, you know, the income that my parents had at the time and the income that I had, I ended up getting, uh, Cal grants and Pell grants and also student loans. And that pretty much, uh, paved the way for me to be able to, you know, pay for college. Uh, once I got into Cal Poly, I think it was a good step, but it wasn't over yet because when, when they started giving us some of the orientations, they told us, look, look around you, you know, uh, 50% of you are not going to make it for this program. So I got scared right away, you know, and maybe it was a good thing that I did. So what did I do is what I did best, right? Study, study hard, make sure that, you know, I got the grades that, that never fell below, uh, the, the average that they wanted you to keep. And um, I went to the program, a Cal Poly program. It took me another um, four years to finish. So I was a little on the long, longer term of finishing college. So three years of community college and four years of Cal Poly. But at the end, I think it was the best thing for me to do. You know, I ended up learning better English, getting trained, mm -hmm. going through the entire program of, of, uh, of, of the Cal Poly architecture program, which is pretty intense and uh, finishing up with uh, pretty decent grades. Um, and it was it was a great journey. One of the things that I did during the architecture program that I think also changed my life, right, in, in, in a good way, was um, participate in the uh, study abroad. Uh, you know, uh, they had a special program the year that I went where you went only for one quarter uh, to, to Italy. And I applied, you know, 16 students got selected. And I was one of the students. And there we go again, right? How am I going to pay for this? <laughs> At that time, I think uh, my brothers were doing better financially. And they saw that that I was doing good in college. So I told my brothers, hey, you know, can you guys let me borrow some money, you know? Uh, uh, the, the school, of course, was providing some of the financial aid and, and grants, but uh, I ended up, you know, collecting money from a lot of my brothers and, you know, you know, having a little, a little account, and that's what I used to, you know, travel abroad. Once you go abroad, you know, I came from Mexico right to the states, and then I went to Italy for for three months. Uh, I ended up staying another month just to see the see the see the see Europe. It was another one of those big life experiences. You know, I, I came back to the States with a new set of eyes of, uh, you know, who I was as a person and, and what the world was about, you know, beyond uh, the United States. Again, great experience. Then after college, I I knew that I wanted to work for a small firm for sure, you know, and uh, I think one of the things that Cal Poly does pretty good is let us know and train us on the workforce. Um, I think in fourth year, we toured something like, you know, 10 to 15 firms in San Francisco and, you know, being a small. And a lot of the professors told me, yeah, you know, if you could work for a big firm, this is where it's going to end up, right? And if you work for a small firm, this is how how, how you're going to end up. So they did, they did a pretty good job um, explaining that to us. Uh, what I wanted from the beginning, again, is one of those things that you don't know why, but it's there in your brain, it, it's to own my own firm. So I told the professors, you know, I want to own my own firm, you know, at some point, I don't know when, but I, I want to do that. And that's when they told me, if you want to do that, make sure you work for a small firm, no more than 10 people. Uh, so that's what I did. You know, I looked for, for jobs here in San Jose. I did apply to the big firms, and I think I might have gotten some interviews and offers from the big firms, but then I found a, a firm about six to seven people, uh, gave me an offer, and I took it. And um, basically, I was with that firm for seven years. Um, after seven years, I felt I plateaued, you know, I felt like there was not a lot there for me anymore. Um, and not necessarily working with, uh, you know, the work-wise, but I, I think uh, my boss tend to 
put a cap on me. I don't know if that that makes sense. You know, he he sort of felt that uh, you know I was going to be no more than a project manager, maybe a senior senior project manager if I if I stayed longer. But again, in the back of my head, I I wanted to be a business owner. So about about you know seven years later, uh, I had already married my wife. You know, we had about a you know a house that we could afford here in San Jose, and I told her, hey, you know, I want to do this. You know. Uh, the the only condition that she had was, hey, we need to have at least uh, six months of savings before you do this, right? So I started thinking about branching off, maybe five years into into in, into the practice, into, into working for somebody else. But then it took me another two years to save enough money for us to have six months of our mortgage and our expenses to for me to be able to branch out. And uh, once we had those six months of savings, I said, you know what, I'm going to go for it. You know, uh, if it doesn't work out, you know, I could always go back and get a job. Um, so what I did, it's, um, I get, you know, with, with, with the help of my family, I think, you know, I, I couldn't get far with, um, the help of my family in many ways. <laughs> so I call my brothers and say, Hey, you know what? Um, I need to fix up the garage. We had a house that was a fixer upper, uh, and the garage was unfinished. You know, you can see the studs in the, you know, rough electrical, rough plumbing. And I told them, I can pay you guys, but I'll, I'll provide pizza and beer. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to Home Depot, you know, got a bunch of sheetrock and got a bunch of, you know, electrical wiring. And I think it took us like two or three weekends with uh, me and a couple of my brothers and friends just uh, fixing up the garage. Uh, we put, you know, we put sheetrock on the garage, electrical, uh, you know, uh, uh, lighting, and I painted the floor with epoxy, so it looked really good. <laughs> mm. I started out of the garage uh, for about a year and a half. So, uh, uh, and then the um, economic collapse of 2008 happened. Uh, the, you know, the 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 thing that kept me going through that whole thing, I think, it was basically us having low overhead in our house you know again you know uh it was a modest house you know three bedroom your typical you know typical house nothing special about it but uh, us having that um that sort of commitment allowed me to stay and my wife was working full-time she always worked full-time so i really thank her for for for, for those you know couple of years at the beginning where you know i was bringing little little money to the to the business uh but um but just having that low, uh, you know, commitments, you know, we, we, we stayed afloat. And she always believed in me. And, you know, my wife was one of those persons that when I would get an encouraged, like, oh, my God, you know, I got to work this month or, you know, we're struggling, you know, the first couple of years. She'd always encourage me to stay and she'd always encourage me to uh, to keep on, you know, keep on doing what I was doing. Because, uh, you know, maybe she saw it. She saw the potential in me that, uh, you know, many times we don't see in, our, in ourselves. And... Uh, Fast forward a couple of years, you know, uh, then I started getting busy again with different type of work, you know, uh, 2008, 2009, I was doing a lot of uh, residential additions, you know, kitchen remodels, you know, started picking up a little uh, commercial work. And then after that, you know, we started getting busy, you know, um, and my wife, my wife said, yeah, that, that's nice. You've been here for a couple of years in the garage. We got contractors knocking on our door at seven in the morning. And no, you, you need to find office space. <laughs> and uh, basically what, what ended up happening, um, I again, you know, I always kept the practice very financially stable and um, taking the risk that I needed to take, but not, not overreach or not too many risks because I, I needed to be comfortable with the steps that I was taking. So I, I went out, you know, found some office space, hired my first employee and started doing work. Um, that was one of the big breakthroughs in the practice for, for me, Enoch, and for me to figure out that I couldn't do this by myself, you know, when I hired my first employee. Uh, by then, I think I was three years into the practice, you know, doing things myself. And when you work by yourself, there is a lot of time that you spend in the practice, right? You know, you have to go get the work. You have to come back and do the work. Then while you're doing some of the some of the projects you have in front of you, you still have to think in the future and you have to do marketing, you have to do business development, you have to go out and meet people. But the amount of hours that, you, that, that I spent working during those two, three years, it was intense, in, in right? You know, I remember spending 16 hour days, you know, three months straight, you know, with no breaks at all. And um, when I hired my first employee, it was an 
eye opening for me because I was always scared of not having to work or or ended up with the wrong people or or they're not gonna do a good job as good of a job as me. Uh and I was telling myself, no, no, I could do a better job. I, I don't need the the extra overhead, the extra responsibility. But once I hired the first employee and I n- noticed that a lot of the work could get done without me being there, it was eye opening. I was like, oh wow, I don't have to be there the sixteen hour days. I could be there twelve. <laughs> I could be there ten. But uh and while I was getting more work or meeting other people or taking care of the current projects in construction, the one employee that I had was cranking at work. So that, that was huge, you know, for me to figure that out. Then it was just a matter of sustaining that and keep it moving forward with the vision of the small practice. Um, I hired my second employee maybe a year later and then the third and then the fourth. Uh, and by then I needed to move out again from the office that we rented because it was too small to a bigger space. One of the, one of the clients that we had um, told me, hey, you know, we got we got space in our building. You know, I, I was hesitant to move into a client's building but the deal was so good and the rates were so great that I'm like, you know what, I want to do it. Um, this particular client, though, uh, wanted, you know, people that he trusted to come to his building. You know, they, they didn't want any uh, any bad people, right, or people that wouldn't pay their rent. So so he scoped me out. You know, he said, yeah, you know, why don't we sign a three-year lease? I'll give you a, 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 an awesome rate and, and we'll see uh, if you want to stay. And I've been here for eight years already. Again, now in this office, we are growing it. We're going to move again, hopefully this summer. Mm-hmm. So it's been, you know, baby steps from, you know, mm. conception of the business to move into a uh, slightly bigger space, a bigger space. And now we're going to hopefully buy a building at this point. I don't think I want to rent anymore. So that's, we're looking into that. Mm, beautiful. Ramiro, take yeah. me back to when you hired that first employee. Did you have, how'd you make that leap? Did you have, a, that's always a big milestone. Did you have a reserve fund? Did you just have a big enough pipeline that you were confident to hire that person to bring him on? How'd you make that leap? I think it was a couple of things, you know, uh, being tired, <laughs> constantly tired of, of working too much <laughs> yeah. and needing the help. But basically, uh, everything that I've done in the practice has been, you know, when I get a good contract. So, so the, mm. the answer is yes. You know, every, every mm-hmm. single time that we ended up uh, with a decent contract, I bought furniture, I bought a computer, mm. I bought a server. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next contract that was like that, I bought more of that stuff, right? Mm. So I did move to the office, to the first office by myself. Uh, there was two two rooms. Um, I furnished them. Uh, you know, I got a phone system. And then there was enough work for me to hire the first employee. Now, uh, I got to be honest, right? You know, she reached out to me. Uh, uh, that She somehow found me online or heard about me. And uh, she uh, was working retail at that time. Uh, she was from uh, Colombia, uh, trained as an architect by working retail. And she said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. Can you hire me? And I said, yeah, absolutely, yes. So I paid her a little more than she was making in retail. So that helped me. Not hiring somebody with a you know four year degree from the, from the from the United States or somebody very experienced. She was very young, almost out of college, and needed a job. So I gave her the job. So it was lucky for me that I found her, and also for her because she got out of that you know situation where she was working retail with an architecture degree from Columbia. Mm. So anyways, I hired I hired her, and it worked out pretty good for a couple of years. Mm. Uh, but mm. yeah, I I think uh, the, the the leap was me being tired of working. You know long hours and the pipeline was you know getting filled for for us to be able to sustain the the um sustain the uh the next the next you know one employee yeah now in those early days so before you met business of architecture what were some of the challenges of the practice i know when you first um came and approached us you were obviously very successful already You'd already done a lot of hard work to build the firm uh, but you found there was there was a plateau you felt like you lacked some knowledge or uh, to be able to get past a certain point in the practice uh, you also mentioned that some of your clients at the time they weren't necessarily the ideal clients so you had brought on Early on, you know, accepted whatever projects we can as we do when we first start a practice and then discovered that, you know, you kind of outgrow them, you know, they're they're not paying enough. They're being very, they're they're demanding a lot of you for not that much money back. Like talk talk to me about that, those growing pains, some of the things that, that were challenging at first that you had to shed to get to where you're at right now. Uh, Yes. Um, I think, you know, even though Cal Poly did a great job training me as an architect, like most schools, they don't train you at all uh, on the business side. I ended up taking, you know, the basic classes, economics or something like that, right? But uh, that to me was one of the hardest things to learn, 
I was a good architect. I had done architecture for seven years with my, you know, with my old boss. I was designing a lot of stuff. I was doing a lot of permit drawings, so, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of permits through the cities and getting those projects built. Uh, but on the business side, I knew nothing, right? So when I went on my own, it was very, almost very naive in a certain extent, right? Uh, and uh, of course, that catches up to you very quickly, right? Like like I said earlier, I was spending a lot of time doing the production and a lot of time doing the business development and a lot of time doing the, the finances, right? Um, I think for that reason, uh, the I, I, would, I would say that the practice grew slowly. Um, because I was learning the business side on the fly, you know, I didn't know anything about business and, you know, like, like everybody else, when you're, I think it was 33, when I started the practice, I sort of had the idea that me doing good architecture was going to bring me the good contracts and, and the big money. Right. Uh, and I was going to be the next Lego Reta or the next, you know, uh, Calatrava, uh, or something like that. Right. Uh, we all have those thoughts when we're young, uh, it catches up to you really quickly. And I figured out that um, I needed the help. Um, I, I remember the time when I first contacted you, I had landed a pretty big project. You know, it was a, a rebuild of a church. You know, the contract for us was, you know, a couple hundred thousand, two, three hundred thousand, which for me at the time was the biggest project that I had ever done. Uh, the firm at the time was uh, five people, four people, actually, because I, I had one in contract, not, not, not an employee. And it was so overwhelming because we needed to get this project into the city within nine months of the fire. It was a reconstruction. It was overwhelming. You know, we, we got the contract somehow. And uh, at the same time, I knew that I needed to bring even more work just to sustain the operation. It was very overwhelming. I felt I felt I needed help. So I just started Googling, you know, hey, you know, how to run an architecture business, you know, how to do this, how to do that. And I found you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I started watching a lot of these podcasts, you know, interviewing with other architects. And I figured that I wasn't alone in this journey. You know, yeah. a lot of the a lot yeah. of the people that you interviewed early on had the same problems that, that I had. And I, I told myself, you know what, I need the help. I can't do this by myself. You know, it, it's overwhelming. You know, I, I, I'm becoming more of a business person than an architect. And that was a little of a struggle for me at the beginning. Now I'm okay with that because, you know, we should be business owners first before we do architecture, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, went through, through the program with Scott Beebe yourself. And um, I ended up... I would say fixing the fixing the, the firm a little bit, you know, in terms of in terms of uh, what I needed to look forward to and and the stuff that I needed to do internally to make the the, the project the, the firm successful. Um, I did plateau at that time because no matter what I did, I couldn't get beyond you know the amount of money we were making and the firm size, you know. And I tried many different things, you know, uh, but uh, it, it felt like. I was at a plateau. It was unencouraging some days, but at the same time, I told myself, you know, I, I need to go beyond this. I need to break the glass ceiling. And how do I do this, right? Um, it, I think when you look down, right, when your head's down and doing the work, that's when you plateau. And I think talking to you and Scott Beebe made me sort of look up and see the horizon and plan for the future. I, I think that was the, 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 the big step forward to me that, hey, you know, it's great doing the work, but now you have, you know, three or four other people that could do the work for you. Your job as a business owner should be to prospect, to look forward, to to have a mission, a vision uh, for the company itself and what is it going to look like not only now, but in the next five to 10 years. So I started thinking about that back then. Um, then I think after the program, the, the company did, did get stabilized for a little bit. Uh, but then I felt like I was on a plateau again, like three years later, three or four years later. I'm like, you know what? The, the, the revenue is getting better. The clients are getting better. I started not taking work that I didn't enjoy, first of all, and that didn't make a lot of money. So so the residential additions, you know, the, 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 the small residential work, I slowly started facing off, which was a little hard for me because... I wanted every single penny that was offered to me, you know, I yeah. wanted the work. But then when you're spending, you know, three or four months on a, you know, somebody's uh, master bedroom and kitchen, well, I could be spending the same amount of time on the, on the, on the commercial work. Uh, 
you know, it, it again, you know, it, it was an eye opener for me that my focus should be on the commercial world, not on the residential world. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of practices out there that do residential, you know, they're really good at it, but my personality didn't really allow me to do that. You know, I, I like things fast paced. I don't want to spend too much time on the intricate details, you know, so I, I started getting into commercial work, just, just regular commercial work, you know, whatever, whatever that was, you know, shopping centers, you know, restaurants, supermarkets. During that time, um, I approached one of the uh, biggest uh, Latino markets here in San Jose, right? They had something like 10 stores. I knocked on the door and I said, hey, you know, I'm Ramiro Torres. This is my card. I do architecture. The next day, the guy calls. He's like, yeah, I got I got projects for you. Uh, I got four projects. Can you do them? I'm like, of course, you know. So he ended yeah. up giving me a bunch of uh, little work, fixing some of the stores with plumbing, you know, little departments here and there. And one day he goes, hey, can you do a new store? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> never never done a supermarket uh, in, in the past. So so we ended up, uh, you know, he ended up leasing the space. It was about 25,000 square feet. And I did the first, uh, you know, Latino supermarket in San Jose, you know. Uh, <laughs> and after that, more of the same work started coming. You know, we ended up doing maybe something like, five stores for that for that one client and then their competition approached me and i said yes absolutely i could do your work too so i was then i did another five or five or six stores for their competition and that was really good enough you know it was it was different type of work you know it paid a little bit better than the residential work and it was fast paced that's what i liked you know we needed to you know go in there design the stores and open them within six months so three months in design three months in construction and the thing would open then we'll jump to the next one and the next one, and the next one. So we ended up doing like ten of those, you know, in the next in the in the in, the, uh, in, the, in, in, in about two years. And I figured that that was the type of work that I wanted to do, that I enjoyed doing, that it wasn't, you know, we didn't get too hung up on the details. It was uh, the the main goal of some of these clients was to open up the store, right? Because every single day that the store was closed, they were losing money. So so um, we ended up. Um, Basically, getting a lot, of, a lot of the work done, and I and I and I figured that that's the type of work that I needed to do, commercial work. Um, and we're still doing that, you know. We're still, you know, doing 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 the commercial work. Yeah, beautiful. Well, tell me. Yeah. So let's let's jump in. Amazing story. Romero, yeah. thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, I sure. think this is going to be really helpful for other people who are in this this nascent phase of, of growing their firms. Now, you're at an interesting point. You had about four people and you have your sight set on 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 bigger, bigger targets. Oh, yes. right? so yes. you're you're on a growth trajectory right now. Mm -hmm. When you look back at the work you've done with us through mm -hmm. smart practice and through coaching with me, you know, I know there's a lot of things that contributed. It's hard mm -hmm. to pick out one thing that was like the key thing that allowed you to grow. But when you look back, if you were giving advice to other firm owners who maybe have been practicing for years and are looking for something new and um, looking for something more opportunity and to find out what's possible for them, what what do you think for you? What has been the, the key changes or benefit or value that you've gotten that has helped you get closer to where you want to be at? I will say the main thing is mindset. You know, we come out of college knowing or think or thinking that we're not going to make enough money as architects. You know, the professors say that. Everybody says that, right? So yeah. when you come out of, you know, one of these colleges, you know, you, you're almost like the, like your future seems to be defined for you that you're not going to make enough money. And I always resisted that. You know, like I, from day one, I'm, I told myself, I am not going to be a poor architect. I am going to be a successful architect. But then it's so ingrained in your brain because everybody tells you that, that it's hard for you to break out of that, out of those thoughts, right? Uh, and when I started working with you and Scott Beebe, uh, basically the, 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 the message was, you could do better, you know, you need to charge more, you know, you need to, you know, break, break, break that, uh, that glass thing financially. And at the beginning, I didn't believe it. I'm like, there's just no way an architect could make, you know, four or $500,000 a year. There's just no way, you know, why? Because that's what we've been told this whole time. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the biggest breakthrough working with business of architecture in, in general was changing your mindset that you actually could be a successful architect in many ways, right? You know, in your practice and mainly financially by changing your mindset that architecture, especially as a business owner, you can actually, you know, have a decent living. 
Um, the other thing for me was I live in Silicon Valley, right? So if I don't make, you know, half a million dollars, I'm poor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> for, for the standards yep. here. Yeah. And uh, again, you know, that didn't seem to take away from the creativity, from the design, from giving back to the community like, you know, a lot of us want to do. You could do all of that stuff and even more when you are financially successful. So I think for me, getting rid of the, you know, and I think you talked about it in some of the, some of the, some of the training, the little monkeys in your brain that are telling you, you can't do this, you can't do this, getting rid of those and bringing in thoughts of, you know what, $400,000, $500,000 a year, it is possible. You know, all you got to do is bring in the right clients, have the right people and look at the books very, very carefully, you know, every single day. So uh, mindset, mm-hmm. I would say, it will be the, That's the number one thing among everything else that comes around the practice, right? PR, you know, project management, you know, processes, uh, financials, you know, uh, yeah, everything forecasting, else, you know forecasting, business development, yep. ev- everything else, HR, thing, I think hiring. It all starts up here. Yeah, well, that's very, that's fascinating. And I'm glad, I'm glad you're telling our audience that because in the decade plus that we've done this, this is, this is the truth that most people overlook or don't want to hear because obviously in our work together, we've done, we've done, we've gone through everything. So you have, we've given you tools, you have HR tools, Mm -hmm. you have hiring tools, you have tools for, you know, evaluating staff performance, for forecasting financials, for the processes, for the systems, like we've given you all that. But it is very interesting and telling that what you're saying is that the biggest, most impactful thing for you hasn't been all those tools and all that tactical stuff and even the strategy, like the vision, the mission, all those are important. But it's been actually what's up here between, you know, the seven inches between our ears. Exactly. That is absolutely right. I think there was a quote once by Henry Ford where he said, whether you believe you can do a thing or whether you believe you can't, you're right. Exactly. Yes, exactly. And uh, if we can't at least really believe at a deep soul core level that that we can achieve something, we'll never even try to accomplish it. I remember there was a a study once that was done. I think of of where they put these fleas in a jar, right? So they had the fleas in this glass jar, and they covered it. And then as the fleas jumped, what would happen is they would hit the top of the covering that was on the jar, and they would stop jumping as high. Right, they stopped jumping as high, and then after a while, they would take the covering off, and then none of the fleas would jump out of the jar, hmm. just because they're just used to not, like you said, someone's told them that they can't, and so they're just like. What was really interesting is like even the next generation of insects that were like born in there, they also didn't jump as high. Interesting, yeah, yeah. But then when they took some fleas from outside and they put those ones back in, those fleas then jumped out. Then they all started jumping out again. Hmm. Sort of like, yeah, I think of Roger Bannister, same thing with the, the four minute mile, right? Is everyone said it's impossible to run a mile in less than four minutes. So no one did it. But then Roger Bannister did it. And then within a year, there were several other people that had run the four minute mile. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so isn't it interesting how we really, we underestimate the power of our minds, don't we? Oh yeah. Big time. I think we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, w- one of the things remember, yeah, is, please. Yeah, no, one of the things they need to change is the school, schooling, because they, they tell yeah. us that, you know? Yeah. And, and at some point when I was making, you know, six figures, barely six figures, I thought it, I had it made. I'm like, oh, this is great, you know? I this is as good as it gets. This is as good as it gets. And, you know, little did I know that it could be, be a lot more than that. Yeah. Little did I know. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, and this is the thing, because... The you read the AI compensation report, you look at what most small firm practitioners are making. Most most small firm practitioners are making anywhere between seventy thousand and maybe one hundred forty thousand take home per year. One hundred forty if they're lucky, right? And so I know a lot of small small firm practitioners in the U.S. You know they they would think it's impossible to really earn anything more than that because they haven't been shown away. So it's it's outside their realm of possibility. Mm-hmm. So it's it's easy to believe when we get caught in that loop that we haven't seen a better way. We think that's all there is. Exactly. But there's so much more. So thank there's you for so sharing that with us, yeah. Romero. Yeah. Yes. Well, Romero, again, if people want to find out more about your firm, uh, they can find you online. Tell us your firm's website. It's at toparchitecture.com, T-O-P-A, yeah. architecture.com. Okay, yes. beautiful. We're going to revamp the website. We're going to put a lot of the new projects that we've, we've been working on in the past two years, and um, it'll launch in a couple of weeks, so the new website. 
Excellent. Well, you know, Romero is one of the new guard of architects who's building a practice based upon solid business principles, marrying up both the architecture and the profitability, uh, because Romero, as we teach in, in smart practice, believes and knows that it doesn't need to be one or the other. You don't need to be a broke architect doing great architecture, or you don't need to be a wealthy architect doing crappy architecture. You can do great architecture and be wealthy and help your team achieve the same. Actually, uh, I do believe in you know, like that. The more abundance you create for your for yourself and for your firm, you know, because you got to share it with the people that make make it happen. You know, your employees and your 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 industry partners. Uh, you could actually do better architecture, you know, when 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 that happens. Um, I discovered that recently. You know, again working with you, that how can I say this? Um, you could bring in the work, but if your team is not inspired, they're not going to do a good job, and Again, you know, you as a business owner, you can't go in there and plug away, you know, do the Revit or do some of the details. You just can't, you know, your, your job is better off doing other stuff. And and how do you do great architecture through your team members is by, I believe, you know, paying them decent, you know, giving them decent bonuses. And at the same time, doing the work through them. If they're inspired, they're going to do amazing, amazing work for you. Uh, and I discovered lately that... The, the better financially the company is, the better architecture we do, you know, the better clients we attract. So it's, 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 um, it's an effect. It's a domino effect. Uh, and again, you know, I haven't changed my passion in architecture. I still love it. Uh, we changed our focus a little bit from just regular commercial work and, 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 and restaurant work to projects that have social impact. And that I think is the future of top architecture. You know, we're doing uh, work that makes us feel good. We're doing work that uh, contributes to society. And personally, I'm doing work that is going to benefit the Latino community, hopefully in, in San Jose and in the, in the Bay Area. And with that, I think, uh, you know, we need to sustain the practice financially well and, you know, do amazing architecture. So that's I'm really excited about the next 10 years of the company because we're heading that in that direction. We hire great people that are very inspired and that's gonna, they're going to help me help them you know, build an amazing firm here in San Jose. Beautiful. Romero. Yes. Well, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you. you know, have a good day. <laughs> you too. Bye for now. Bye. And that's a wrap. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. The Big Red A is coming to San Francisco. If you're going to the AIA 23 conference, go stop by RCAT at booth 835. RCAT saves you time and money with over 10,500 manufacturer listings by Alpha or CSI section, 7,000 free BIM models, 900 specs, and much more like Spec Wizard, the patented tool that allows you to configure and generate a full three-part specification in minutes. If you're a manufacturer of fine building products, also please stop by RCAT and see how they can get you in front of AEC professionals searching for the right solutions for their projects. Go ahead on over to the Big Red A at booth 835 at the AIA conference. I'll see you there. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.